subtrochanteric femoral fractures. This is from the OTA Residency Core Curriculum Lectures version 5, slides by Dr. Brandon Yuan. I'm Saki Brahman narrating, and in this first video, we will uh, go through the anatomy and uh, classification, and in the next uh, two videos, we'll cover technique and then controversy and clinical application. So uh, these are the objectives. We're going to first talk about unique anatomical consideration of subtrochanteric femur fractures, and this is really important and foundational to understand um, how we then apply technique, because a lot of it has to do with the anatomy, the deforming forces, etc. So there's a bimodal incidence with these injuries. Uh, we see them in younger patients as high energy injuries. Uh, a lot of times there are associated life and limb threatening injuries. Um, as, and in, this, in the other uh, group, we have geriatric patients. So subtrochanteric femur fractures can happen from low energy falls from standing. Another uh, Injury to keep in mind is the atypical, sorry for the typo, subtrochanteric femur fracture that can happen from prolonged bisphosphonate use. So uh, in a young patient, oftentimes high energy trauma, uh, so you have to consider ATLS protocol, associated injuries. A lot of times you're putting these patients in temporary skeletal traction. In the older patients, you have to think it's often a low energy injury. Um, you do have to consider um, asking about prodromal pain. Uh, were they having pain for a while before this happened? That can often be from a pathological fracture or sometimes that atypical femur fracture we were talking about from prolonged bisphosphonate use can potentially have uh, prodromal pain. And then you also have to look to the contralateral side to see if a stress fracture is developing there. So let's talk about anatomy. I think this is the main part of this first video. So you really have to understand the bony and soft tissue anatomy because as I mentioned, it's very important when you have to learn how to reduce these position patients. And we'll talk about a lot of that in the next video, but it's all predicated on the anatomy. So this is a really interesting um, clinical image here. This is out of Rockwood and Green. And this shows the... Um, you know, how you have essentially the largest asymmetric difference in load in a single bone in the body. So if you look here in the subtrochanteric region, you'll see that there's, you know, maximal compressive forces medially, right, in that subtrochanteric region, and then tensile forces laterally. Okay, so this is really important when it comes to thinking about you know, how we have to fix these and how implants fail, for instance. Um, so remember, bone heals under compression, uh, but in general, that lateral subtrochanteric cortex is always under tension. So when we reduce these, you want to try to minimize lateral gapping. You don't want to have varus. Uh, you want to try to do everything you can to get compression of the lateral cortex. You may want to think even about tension band concepts um, to uh, provide compression at the f lateral cortex um, when you load these. So um, the, the fracture itself tends to isolate a short proximal fragment. And on that proximal fragment, there's a lot of deforming forces. So you have to just keep in mind that um, when you have this very short proximal fragment, uh, you have uh, similar challenges to when you have uh, proximal tibia fractures, proximal humerus fractures, where you have a very short proximal segment and the room for error becomes very small in terms of your implant placement, your trajectory. So in this case, you can see a lot of things creating a problem. Hopefully you recognize that this is a malreduction. You have a lateral entry point. You have a trajectory that's going very, very lateral to medial. Um, and, uh, you know, that alone is going to set you up for uh, a varus malreduction. So we talked about deforming forces. So you have multiple large muscles acting on the proximal segment in which you have external rotation. Okay. You have 
flexion. So the iliopsoas and short external rotators are going to um, act to create this this deformity, right? So flexion primarily from the iliopsoas, right? A little bit from the abductors also. And there's potentially abduction from the abductor muscles on the proximal fragment, and this will lead to varus. Distally, the main deforming force on the distal fragment are your adductors, and that will lead to shortening and medial translation. So if you think about it, there's all these deforming forces causing flexion, abduction of the proximal fragment, external rotation of the proximal fragment, and then adduction of the distal fragment. And unfortunately, this will lead you with deformity if fixed in that position. And when you treat these, you have to overcome all these forces to get an appropriate reduction. So this is something that doesn't quite happen with inner trochanteric femur fractures. But when you have a fracture line that's more distal in the subtrochanteric region, you can see in the image on the left how all those deforming forces kind of work opposite from each other. So it's not balanced. So a subtrochanteric femur fracture is any fracture within five centimeters of the lower extent of the lesser trochanter, meaning five centimeters from here. So within that region is a subtrochanteric femur fracture. I mean, a fracture down here is essentially, you know, you get into just femoral shaft territory. And we're not really thinking as much about, you know, the deforming forces, for instance. Like if you come back here, you know, once you have a fracture that occurs down at this level, you don't have all these deforming forces. All these muscles are acting on a fragment that's coming down to here and is being balanced by by this here. So there's some deforming forces, but not like with the subtrochanteric fracture. So in the OTA classification, um, these are usually the 31 type, but actually also the 32 type because you're getting into the diaphysis technically with the subtrochanteric fracture. So it depends if you look on the right where that fracture line is and where it extends. So these incorporate both the 31 and the 32s. All right, so we're going to pause there because the next section on technique is uh, really deserving of its own separate video because there's a lot of technique that goes into appropriately managing these injuries. Thanks.